Jacker, calling himself D.B. Cooper, jumped from an airliner in flight, carrying 200,000 bucks in ransom cash, and disappeared. Diving from a hijacked plane, having bundles of money on your back, and disappearing straight into the jungle with no trace at all. It's truly a bewildering mystery that you shouldn't miss. Watch this video to the end to find out all about it. Hey folks, welcome back to Conspiracy Theorists, your go-to channel for all the strange, mysterious conspiracy theories. In today's video, we'll see the conspiracy theories about D.B. Cooper, the non-traceable hijacker. So let's begin. Who exactly is D.B. Cooper? Since November 24, 1971, when a strange man hijacked an aircraft from Portland to Seattle, demanded parachutes and $200,000, and skydived into folk hero history, the question has remained. Cooper's identity and destiny are unclear, and there are numerous speculations regarding both. Cooper purchased his aircraft ticket for $20 under the name Dan Cooper. The DB was misreported early on and remained with the case. Cooper left relatively few traces. One of them is a clip-on tie from which DNA was taken in 2001, allowing a few promising possibilities to be ruled out. He also left a parachute and its bag behind. An eight-year-old boy on a camping trip discovered $5,800 of Cooper's ransom money in 1980. On the day before Thanksgiving, November 24th, 1971, a nondescript man in his mid-40s and around six feet tall purchased a $20 ticket for Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305. He offered his name as Dan Cooper, which was later revealed to be a forgery. He gave a note to a flight attendant shortly after departing from Portland, claiming to have a bomb in his briefcase. He then opened the Attache case, which included various wires, red sticks, and a battery. Cooper demanded four parachutes and $200,000, all in $20 bills. Cooper freed the 36 passengers after the plane landed in Seattle after authorities supplied money and parachutes. He did, however, make two pilots, a flight engineer and a flight attendant, stay on the plane. After refueling, he instructed the pilots to fly to Mexico City. According to his directions, the plane flew at a speed of fewer than 200 knots at a height of fewer than 10,000 feet. Cooper descended the rear stairs and jumped around 8 p.m. between Seattle and Reno, Nevada, widely assumed to be near Ariel, Washington. He then vanished. The FBI launched an operation called Norjack in hopes of tracking down Cooper, which would become one of the longest and most extensive investigations in the agency's history. Cooper was initially thought to be familiar with both planes and the area, and it was speculated that he had served in the military, possibly as a paratrooper. However, it was later determined that he was not an experienced skydiver because the jump was too dangerous, and he failed to notice that his reserve parachute was sewn shut for use in training. The agency said that it investigated 800 suspects in the first five years, with nearly all of them being eliminated. Some were ruled out based on DNA found from the tie Cooper was wearing prior to jumping. Richard Floyd McCoy, the main suspect, was arrested for a similar act many months later. He was, however, ruled out as a suspect because he did not match the descriptions offered by two flight attendants. Many people assumed Cooper, who was dressed in a business suit, trench coat, and loafers, did not survive. The winds reached more than 200 miles per hour at that altitude, and the parachute he was using couldn't be guided. Furthermore, he would have landed in a mountainous, highly forested location. After years of following dead ends, investigators got a break in 1980 when a kid discovered a decaying box containing $5,800. It was buried north of Portland, about 20 miles from Ariel, along the Columbia River. The serial numbers on all the $20 bills matched those of the ransom. However, despite a thorough search, nothing else was uncovered. The Cooper case entices law enforcement, such as FBI agent Larry Carr, who renewed interest in the case in 2007, as well as amateur detectives who pour over its minutiae on online message boards. Cooper is still a pop culture icon, with a music festival named after him. But who was he? And what occurred after he jumped off Flight 305? Here are only a few of the explanations proposed throughout the last four decades. D.B. Cooper died after the jump. The obvious initial conclusion is that D.B. Cooper, whoever he was, did not survive the jump. According to the FBI, even if he made it to the ground alive, it was winter and he was outfitted for plane travel, not jungle survival. He probably certainly had no partners waiting for him. For one thing, no one could have tracked his whereabouts. 
His instructions to the pilot were just, fly to Mexico, and he jumped at a random area with no ground visibility, according to Carr. However, his body and the parachute he used were never discovered. Kenneth Christensen In 2007, Geoffrey Gray's New York Magazine piece Unmasking D.B. Cooper and the following book, Skyjack, The Hunt for D.B. Cooper, both published in 2007, provided an in-depth look at the case. He was the first journalist to be granted access to the FBI's Cooper case files, so his perspective is exceptionally thorough. Lyle Christensen, an old man who had been convinced that his late brother Kenneth was Cooper, approached Gray. According to the old man, Kenneth Christensen was a paratrooper whose first deployment occurred shortly after World War II. After leaving the service, he worked as a mechanic and flight purser for Northwest Orient Airlines, the airline Cooper chose for his hijacking. There were other unsettling parallels, such as Kenneth's love of bourbon and the fact that he'd purchased a home not long after the crime. Author Gray showed Kenneth's photo to the lone surviving hijack witness, a flight attendant that November night, and she recognized the resemblance. The FBI, on the other hand, is skeptical. Its response to Gray's initial article highlighted the fact that Christensen had been a paratrooper, which the agency believes the hijacker could not have been, as well as the fact that Christensen was shorter and smaller than eyewitnesses' descriptions of Cooper. Furthermore, the hijacker had hair, whereas Christensen was balding. Though, as a friend observed, Kenny occasionally wore a blonde wig. John List One completely ridiculous theory before wrapping this up. In 1971, the same year D.B. Cooper disappeared in thin air, John List murdered his entire family. He was caught in 1989 after living under a false identity for 17 years. According to Ralph Himmelsbach, a retired FBI agent living in Portland, Oregon, List and Cooper have similar descriptions. Cooper was said to be in his mid-40s. At the time of the slayings, the list had 44 people on it. They were both around the same height and weight. And they both wore glasses. Himmelsbach further claimed that List had squandered the last $200,000 in his mother's savings account just before the murders. Cooper wanted, and was given $200,000 before jumping out of the plane near Mount St. Helens in Washington State. He was never found again. Although the FBI continued to receive tips, it officially halted its investigation in 2016, arguing that its resources were better spent on other investigations. That was the video, guys. To know more about this case and other conspiracy theories around it, comment below and let us know. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to regularly receive our content. Thanks for watching.